So now we are continuing according to the schedule. And our next speaker comes from London. She is a UX designer, uh, deals with content reach websites and loves information design. She is going to tell us a story about storytelling. <laughs> so, your applause for Holly Wubak. Cool. Um, okay, uh, so as you said, I'm a user experience designer, so why would I want to talk about stories in the first place? So I guess I should give you a bit of background. Um, in the last year or so, I switched jobs to work for quite a different company from what I used to. I used to do a lot of cultural sites for museums and galleries, and I switched to quite a commercial company that we actually work with a lot of news organizations and publishers. So storytelling became much more important in terms of my work, and actually learning how to do content strategy was really, really important to that. Um, and I just think it made me reflect on when we're doing work with other people who aren't necessarily um, very comfortable storytellers, how we actually get them to tell those stories. Because it becomes increasingly, if you can't reach the audience that you need to, which is you need to be publishing content and telling stories to do, then you can't actually um, achieve as much as you could do with your product or service. So I thought it was a good idea to kind of go through some of the things that I've learned in the last year about how we tell stories effectively, um, how we can use stories for design thinking, as well as um, how they can kind of uh, imprint things in our minds and make it a much richer uh, storytelling experience. So I'm gonna go through a few different things. So. Why do stories affect people is the first thing. Um, how we use storytelling in design. I'll just go back because I'll skip this guy. Um, some basics for storytelling and making sure that we're telling coherent product stories. So that comes down to content strategy. So that's probably the biggest thing um, that's a difference in my work now from what it used to be, is actually learning how to do that content strategy. So what I'm seeing on my screen is not necessarily the same as what you've seen, as we've just learned. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so why do stories affect people in the first place? Uh, so we use them kind of daily to communicate. When you need, meet a new person, you're continuously telling them stories about who you actually are and what you believe in, and it's how we kind of connect with each other. And it's something that we've been doing from a very young age. So it's often kind of, we're very astute story consumers, but we might not realize this because we've been hearing them since we were very, very small children. It's also been part of our societies and culture um, from the absolute beginning. Before we had a written culture, we had an oral culture. So actually listening to stories and communicating in that way is incredibly powerful because it goes back to the roots of our societies and who we actually were. So this is my mum. She is probably the reason that I like stories so much. She's an amazing storyteller. So she's a teacher for, I think... Well, she's retired now, but she used to teach kind of seven to 11-year-olds, so a little bit of a tricky age. And so she's very, very comfortable with storytelling, which as a child is amazing, because she told us so many stories when we were growing up. So the best thing about her storytelling ability is that you could, um, you could basically just give her a subject, and she could make up a story and make up these very, very credible characters for these um, like short stories when we were kids. So it was really amazing. So I think she's been a big influence on actually why I think stories are so powerful, because she kind of taught me that if you can tell a coherent story, you can actually really reach people in a very different way than just communicating kind of normally. So there is a kind of bit of science behind it all as to why they actually affect us all um, more psychology. So when, um, when you're listening to a story, your brain is actually much more active. And it means that you're having a much richer brain event, and therefore you're taking it in in a much more deep way than you normally would do. So it's actually a really good way to affect people, and they're going to remember it much more than if you just kind of give them straight facts. If you put a story around it, give it kind of a purpose and meaning, then it really gets to them. And it even goes to the point where, when you're telling a story, you're kind of affecting the same areas in people's brains that it would be if it was actually happening to them. So you end up kind of having this shared experience where you've experienced one thing, and as you share it with the other person, they start to experience it, and the same kind of areas in the brain are triggered. So I think that's kind of uh, a little bit of the background as to why they're so powerful. But I think it's just something that's kind of intrinsic to all of us that we sort of inherently understand but don't necessarily leverage as well as we could do. And in terms of design, we kind of, we do do stories. So when we're building products, maybe we write user stories. Maybe that's how we actually structure our work is around storytelling. But there are lots of different ways we can actually do it or facilitate stories in other people that mean that we have a much richer experience. So these are kind of the four types of storytelling. It's very blurred, actually. 
Um, but I'll read it out to you then. Um, so there's user research, which I think of as being a story facilitator. So you're using interviewing techniques to actually get people to tell you their stories themselves. Uh, we run workshops, which I think of as kind of a group storytelling method. Uh, we do user experience mapping or user experience type design. So we have a step-by-step -step process to actually kind of tell the story of how someone would use a product or service. And we also use prototypes. And prototypes, we kind of use them as a prop. So when we go and do um, kind of user testing, we have this prop that people can actually touch and interact with. And that's a much richer experience than if you're just trying to explain a concept to someone. So if we look at kind of interviewing techniques, quite often we go out and do, if we've got enough time, we do kind of ethnographic research. And it's effectively, you go and meet people in the places that they work or where they would actually use your products and ask them to kind of just talk you through everything that they're doing, what their pain points are, what their needs are. And from that, we have to kind of turn that into something tangible. So whether that's um, a spec for development or whether it's kind of a visual design, we're kind of taking these stories in and helping people to actually tell them and then turning it into something tangible. So we need to be using our kind of story, yeah, story facilitation skills, but also story translation skills into something visual or actually physical. And when we do workshops, I tend to do lots of workshops with activities because I get bored quite easily. So I like to keep it a bit more active. And a lot of the things that we do are actually centered around role play. So having people imagine that they are the user of the service rather than they're the builders of the service and making sure that they can um, talk about these things in a different way and they can actually kind of empathize with the people who will be using it rather than thinking of themselves as the user. So we kind of use role play or games to try and make people come out of themselves a bit and think in that slightly different way. And because we're all kind of used to telling stories, we get them to give really minute details about people's lives. So it might even be what someone had for breakfast or they were slightly annoyed when they were eating their breakfast. And drawing out these kind of feelings and these processes means that people kind of get these um, kind of fictional people, the users, into their minds much more easily than if we just said, and here's your persona, if you read it, it's going to be good and we're going to design for that person. We prefer to actually workshop it so it makes a lot more sense. Uh, then we do kind of user journey mapping. So this is based on the interview techniques that we've done, also on some of the workshops probably that we've run. So they kind of combine business needs with user needs as well. So we sort of start all the way at the beginning of a product. So when someone has actually discovered something, um, They've heard about it from a friend, they've seen it on social, anything like that, all the way through to actually what you need to do for them to become an advocate for your product. So that they're kind of telling people about it and making sure that you know, you're spreading that word and engaging more easily. And I think it's something that's really, really important to consider for open source because we don't tell very good stories. And it kind of doesn't connect with necessarily as wide an audience as we should be able to. It's people need to sort of empathize and feel like they're part of it. So actually getting to know people who are outside of the user group that you normally think of is really, really important. And some of these kind of interviewing or mapping techniques can help you actually take sort of take it out of, OK, I use it every day and it's fine. It's probably not fine for someone who's not as technical or doesn't necessarily know as much. They don't know the stories behind it. Um, and then we use prototypes as props. So this is, if it'll play, it's very blurry, but you can kind of see it. So um, we do this so when we're testing, people can actually physically touch something and make sure that we can see how they're interacting with it in the real world. And this is another type of storytelling that we do, which is actually quite often we'll make little films about people's lives and how a product could actually feature in it. So it kind of goes, all the work that we've done um, beforehand kind of goes into this. And as you can see, this is my colleague Sam, who we make star in the videos. He's very kind and <laughs> allows us to actually do that. But we kind of go around and we make up these stories in this whole sort of film scenario of actually how someone would use it. And it's really, really good when we're communicating not only with kind of users of what something might be like. So if we can't build it, we can maybe film it and fake it. And actually from that, we can get a lot of um, information from people. And the other reason that prototyping is so good is obviously for rapid iteration. We're doing these for storytelling techniques for whether it's uh, user research based or whether it's actually to sell it into a wider audience. When we're prototyping, we're always iterating. We're moving from one thing to another very, very quickly to make sure that we're not kind of spending too much time in one area that actually people have no interest in. So kind of the products need stories piece is really I think it's the thing that has changed the most in my mindset because I used to do a lot of the work before, like the user stories, um, interviewing and things, but actually looking at more 
what is the impact of telling a decent story on your market share and actually looking at that in terms of a business model is quite different. And it's, it's kind of a very commercial mindset, but actually if you take the money equation out of it, it really is about um, getting that awareness out there and bringing it through. So quite often we have something called um, market fog. And that effectively is that there are a lot of different products, services, um, whatever it is that you're building, someone has probably already built it. Or there's probably quite a lot of um, people who are doing something very, very similar. And you need to find a way to stand out. And quite often, this is, a, um, this is something that we go through with clients. We'll do an analysis of the whole kind of landscape or vertical that they're working in and make sure that are there any areas that differentiate them? If not, what can we do to make sure they are differentiated so people can actually see them stand out? And this is a super marketing-based um, kind of diagram. I don't know if you guys have seen this before. It's effectively an engagement funnel. So you start all the way at the top with you have, say, 100 people who are aware of your product or service. And of those 100, maybe only 80 or so would ever consider using it. And then of those 80, maybe you know, 50 have a go and 30 might show a preference for using it. And then once they've kind of shown a preference, maybe only 10 perform some sort of action. So whether that's actually signing up for a service or becoming, uh, which we want at the end, a very loyal customer, which is even narrower set of people. So one of the reasons that we kind of advocate for content strategy and people being very aware that um, they need to tell the stories of the products is that it manages to increase your awareness. So the theory is the more people who are aware of your product or service, as long as it's fairly decent, that is a kind of uh, issue sometimes, as long as it's working well and people would want to use it, the more people who are aware, the more people will actually use it eventually. So that's kind of how we sort of talk to clients about it. So you have all these different people in the same marketplace as you, and then hopefully, It'll make you stand out. So I played with a lot of animations in this deck. I got a bit animation heavy last night, so <laughs> please excuse that. Um, but now we'll come on to the basics of actually telling a story. And um, this is the most complex bit, because if you don't have a huge content team, it can be very, very difficult to publish enough information to actually have the need for a content strategy. But even, even if it's just in kind of talking to people for funding or actually selling things to your team, storytelling can be really, really helpful. So the first part of it is who is the audience, which hopefully if you've done some of the interviewing and you've done some market research, you have an idea of who your audience is. But it could actually equally be your teammates. If you have a great idea that you really want to get through, if you can use some storytelling techniques and kind of frame it in a way that it's packaged up, it's going to be much more easy to sell to the team. Or even if you're going for funding, actually learning how to put those kind of decks together that tell the story of a service is really, really important. And then what is the goal of your story? So it can be quite confusing if you're trying to tell too many different things at once. So it's really important to narrow down and actually decide what is the goal of the storytelling that you want to do. If it's to build awareness, then that's one thing. If it's to specifically um, convert users from being kind of uh, casual users into being very uh, dedicated users, that's a slightly different thing. The reason that we look at kind of audiences and um, making sure that we're designing for them is we need to know how they actually speak. So we sound the same as they do. We don't sound inconsistent with their view of who they are. Um, people have this thing called a self-story, and it's very intrinsically tied up with your kind of psychology of who you actually are. And it becomes, a, it becomes almost kind of your belief system. I'm this type of person because I say I am, and this is how I present myself to the world. And this is therefore my self-story. So if someone saw themselves, for example, as... Um, sort of very tech savvy, they would want to sort of take that in and be part of their actual self story. And the issue with that is that people like to have consistencies with their self stories. So they don't really like it if um, something comes up that doesn't exactly link into that story and it makes them question whether, for example, they were tech savvy in the first place. So we kind of don't want to ruin it for them. It's very, very difficult to change people's self-stories. A lot of these things are, as I said, very tied up in belief systems, and it's very, very difficult to change those sort of emotional feelings about who someone is. There are ways to do it with storytelling, but it's quite... Um, it's a bit more of a difficult task than just kind of conforming to it and talking to an audience in the way that they see 
themselves in. So when I was um, looking up kind of more information on why storytelling works, there was a story um, in there uh, about actually making people convert their self-stories from one into another. And it's very difficult and it takes kind of a little bit time, like a little bit each time to make sure that you are actually converting them. So um, the story is basically uh, there's a lady and she has two children and a husband. This is kind of in the early 2000s. MP3 players have just come about. She's very excited. She's a huge music fan. But she sees herself as not being an Apple person. So the iPods just kind of come out, first, first generation, whichever uh, time period that is. And she sees herself as n not being Apple. Why would she do that? Her husband has Apple. He's a designer. It's just for them. It's not for me. I would never buy that. That's not my sort of thing. And then it gets to Christmas, and she's got two teenage children. And the children are begging her for the new It gadget, which is the iPod at this point. So she has a choice to make. Do it, does she perform something that's inconsistent with her self-story of I'm not an Apple person and get the kids what they want? Or does she disappoint her children, which is a very difficult um, kind of thing. And she, she actually buys it for the children. And so after Christmas, she sees them playing with it. And she sees her kind of slightly shitty, bad user experience um, MP3 player, because at that point, they weren't great. And um, she's jealous of what the kids have, because it's so much easier for them to use. And at this point, she thinks, I want one of those. So. She's already done that little bit of a break in who she thought she was in buying it for the children, and then she kind of upgrades that break and buys it for herself. And little by little, um, so when her computer next dies, she's kind of opened up to the idea that maybe her next computer should have been a Mac rather than what she previously would have bought. So these self-stories can be changed, but they take these tiny incremental actions, and once you've kind of put a crack in someone's self-story, you can actually kind of leverage it. It sounds like a bad thing to do. It's not necessarily in a bad way, depending on what you're trying to actually use it for. But one of the reasons that self-stories, I think, are so prevalent and actually are becoming much more so, is that they kind of perpetuate these filter bubbles, which we live in anyway. And it's all tied into these beliefs of who you actually are. And if you're only receiving information that confirms that, it's going to get more complicated. So there's kind of pros and cons to these storytelling approaches that if you... Um, if you only target people whose self-story you already fit in with, you're kind of, you know, you're not really opening up as much as you could do. To do the other thing and actually try and target a different type of user, you need to be very careful and put these like very small incremental changes in place so that they can kind of come on a longer term journey with you. So it's not just like one shift to another. It's sort of a coaxing. It's a much more gentle journey of switching the story. So when we're actually using these storytelling methods, what are we really doing? So, well, first we're storytelling, but we're selling ideas. And actually, the most important one is selling the dream. And again, I can't see what you can. So, uh, 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 animation heavy. Come on, come on, right. It won't load until it's actually gone through the whole animation. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, there we go. Okay, cool. And then, um, so... The next piece that I was going to talk about is what's the one thing that you want them to know. So if you can actually work out what the one essential piece of information is and then how you want to say it, because you've got to know your audience, so you should have some idea of how to say it. If you try and do storytelling, I'd, I'd say start with one message, one key message first, and then expand it out. If you're going to produce content, people always like stuff that's entertaining or educational. They prefer something that kind of has meaning to them. So either you make me laugh, you make me happy, or if I'm feeling in the mood, you make me sad. But if you give me something educational, it's much easier to produce that type of content time and time again. Not everyone has the budget or necessarily the right kind of um, clients or audience to do something funny all the time. It's not always appropriate. But educational stuff is always going to go down well because you help someone in their lives. They're going to remember that. And actually, you're kind of starting those um, small shifts in what services they'll use. And essentially, stories come down to being about people. That's, we, we always find a story much easier to take in if there's someone in it that we relate to or that we can understand the difficulties that they're facing. And it makes it a much more compelling story if you can do that. The stronger the feelings you have actually about the stories, the more likely you are to be able to change the way that people are thinking. 
This is kind of a bit more storytelling theory, but it's um, a very, very simple narrative structure, which we use quite often when we're doing pitch decks. And it's very, very um, simple to follow. And I think it's quite a good way of actually doing it. So you, you kind of start with the beginning piece, which you're setting the scene, you're presenting any characters that you might have or any important backstory. So when we kind of do this, this is normally like who we are as a company, um, what we think the brief was. And then we kind of move into the next stage, which is kind of the building the tension. Here we normally set out the strategic objective. So what is our big strategy for the future? What are we going to do? And then we go to kind of the high point, the climax, the exciting bit, which we normally present the design work at this piece of the deck. So we've kind of built it up. We've said, this is who we are. This is what we believe you should be doing. And this is how our vision for it actually translates into visual. People find it a lot easier to digest the visual necessarily than the strategy. So it's quite good to have that as early as possible, but not too early because people tend to switch off afterwards. So after that, we kind of um, we pull in a bit more of the actually logistical stuff of how you're going to do it. So that's kind of like we're sort of telling you sort of implementation strategies, maybe content strategies, a little bit more um, in-depth technical knowledge there. We might actually set out the tech approach at this point after the designs. And then we wrap it all up with kind of project plans or actually how we deliver it. If it's kind of a huge shift in terms of mentality, then it will be kind of we can do this in phases or implementation. But it's quite an easy way to actually sort of structure these sort of decks when you need to sell something. So the screen's gone off. So. That's OK. OK, cool. I'll just keep talking then. Um, so when we're, um, once we've kind of got these sort of storytelling methods down, then we look at content strategy. So we've kind of set up the proposition for the whole products. We've done all of our design um, thinking to actually make sure that it's suitable for purpose. And then we need to kind of make sure that we're talking to people across all the different touch points. So we know that people have, um, hopefully, lots of different interactions with us. So it might be word of mouth. It could be kind of a messaging app. It could be email marketing. It could be on social networks. It might even be kind of posters around a venue, like these ones. Or um, it might be online. So there are all these different touch points that people get exposed to our um, products or services through. And it's very, very difficult to keep that coherent unless you put in a strategy at the beginning. So I can see my slides, but you can't. So this one is about connected communication strategies. So if we want to connect with people across the strategies, we may need to make sure that our storytelling is consistent. If it feels like one of the channels is very, very off, so for example, your social channel doesn't make any sense with the actual product that you've got or the service or um, application, then you're going to struggle quite a lot in terms of making sure that people are on board. So you need to put these kind of basic pieces in place to make sure that you're actually getting that storytelling right. So the first piece is what are you actually going to talk about? What are the themes and subjects that A, your audience is interested in, but actually slightly more importantly is what have you got expertise in? What can you talk about because of the knowledge that you have rather than other people? Are you going to turn it around? This is such, this is such a great plan. Thank you. <laughs> Did it work? Oh, now it's gone. <laughs> OK, cool. You fix that one. That'll be good. <laughs> That's a technical hindrance, but it's OK. Oh, yeah. Oh, and it's back. It's back. You, we fixed everything all at once. OK, perfect. <laughs> so it probably looks better on that screen anyway, because I chose very, very bright colors that I think actually got quite bleached out in the projection, uh, which was my fault. I should have thought about that. Um, so we'll go back to that. So what do you talk about? So what themes are you actually an expert in that you can um, talk about without it seeming a bit off? And that comes down to the authenticity of your voice and the authenticity of your storytelling. Do these themes actually link to what you're talking about? And if they don't, then that can also be quite difficult as well. So you need to make sure that you're an authority in it and it makes sense with what you're doing. And the third piece is actually, um, what is your point of difference? Are you talking about something that none of your competitors are talking about? If they're not talking about it, is that actually a gap in the market, or is that something that people aren't talking about it because they don't want it? So with this, you need to be very careful and make sure that you've actually understood your users properly, because quite often there is something that no one else is talking about that if you start, you're going to get a lot of traction with, so it makes it very um, 
useful to actually know what those people are doing. So you might kind of just do a quick competitor analysis over other people's social channels or email marketing. The next piece is how you actually speak. So this is kind of your tone of voice and making sure that the language and sort of the way that you're writing or the way that you're speaking actually makes sense with um, your audience. So you kind of have a personality, so you're going to be friendly or serious, pieces like that. So that's kind of the overall setup of what the product or service is. Then you have the voice, so that's your style or your point of view. Are you going to be more formal or casual? So you can be friendly but very formal, or you could be friendly but very casual. And then um, the last piece is actually the tone, and that's the one that's quite difficult to put your finger on. And quite often you need to shift that depending on which channel you're actually talking through. So obviously social is a bit more informal, um, and email marketing might be a little bit more formal than social is. So you need to make sure that you're tailoring it actually to the channel, but also um, be appropriate to what you're talking about. Then we have how long you actually speak for. So we kind of... Um, we go through clients with kind of short, medium, long pieces of content. Not everyone is up for reading an essay. Some people are, but quite a lot of people just want something very short. And it's actually looking at ways that you can use one long piece of content and cutting it up in different ways so you can reuse it and actually kind of turning it into sort of a content atom that can be, you can pull a quote from one article, put it together with a set of pieces from another article, and you've actually built a new piece of content from existing pieces. So this is something we go through with people quite a lot because it means that actually you get the most value out of any content that you produce. And then we talked to them about reading patterns. So this is the one where these diagrams aren't scientific, they're just for illustrative purposes. But we talk about uh, in terms of people skimming, so it's kind of skim reading, you go through kind of headlines, very, very quick consumption of content. Then we have dipping, so you might kind of click on a couple of headlines, read the first paragraph, that's it, you come out, you can't be bothered to read the rest. Um, we have browsing, so you're kind of, you've got a bit more time on your hands at this point. You might investigate a few subjects, you're not going to do sort of onward um, digging from it, but you might read a whole article. And then we have kind of digging mentalities, and we know that when people are consuming content, they kind of vary between these different types, so you need to make sure you have content for all of them. And the digging is the most complex one, because it's where someone needs to go kind of from one article to another article and actually be able to find more in-depth, more technical type knowledge than they would do otherwise. This is the one that people always struggle with. We're always like, what is your content plan for the next couple of years? What's going to happen? A lot of the time people don't know, but you might know that you've got a new product release coming out. Uh, you might have a new piece to the service and actually making sure that you're planning your content around that and you're ready for it when it happens so you're not kind of scrambling to put those things together on the fly is really, really important. And even it can be as simple as kind of noting down sort of holidays and big events in the markets that you're dealing with and making sure that you have content that's relevant to those for when people are looking at them. We also try and look at actually what the audience does in terms of browsing habits. So this is a super, very, very sketchy um, social media consumption um, habit. So normally uh, we've start to see trends in people kind of waking up and actually catching up on their content feed. So it's kind of, it's quite different now than it used to be because people will have their kind of phones next to their, you know, maybe even in their bed or next to their bed. So they'll, they'll get up and they'll quickly catch up on things actually before they start their day. Um, so we know that at that point it's a very quick catch up type behavior versus lunchtime when you're probably bored at work or, you know, during the day when you're a little bit bored, you want a bit of distraction. So we need to find content that works for that. And then in the evening, if, um, you know, you have a bit of time on your hands, you might be watching something on your TV and then reading an article at the same time. That's become a much more common pattern that people will actually um, be using multiple screens at once. So making sure that there's content that's light enough that you can be kind of doing two things at once is really important. It's a bit of a weird, it's a bit of a weird thing, but I think we probably all do it. You'll sit there and you'll start watching something, you'll get a bit bored and you'll start reading another thing or you'll research the thing that you're watching on the TV. I do that quite a lot because I have no patience for waiting until the story's ended. <laughs> um, so this is kind of my checklist for how to use stories. So whether you're doing it for design thinking or whether you're doing it actually for content strategy, we always start with the who you're telling the stories to, so making sure that you've done your market research, you've spoken to your target audiences, whether it's surveys, competitor analysis, or actually just looking at social content that's doing really well for other people. Uh, then we make sure that we know what we're going to talk about. So what are you an expert in? What does your product do that no one else does? How can you speak about it in a way that's kind of relevant to that audience? 
So this is the how. So that's your kind of tone of voice and your content format. So if you have an audience that's very easily distracted, visuals and video are great. Otherwise, maybe they've got a bit more time to take in written content. And then the last piece of the pyramid is when. So this is making sure that you've planned your content for the whole um, piece. You've made sure that you know about kind of browsing habits, so you do it in time with what people's behaviors will be. Often this is actually a social plan and not necessarily a content plan. So you might be producing this content systematically throughout the day, the week, the year. You might only produce content sort of once every month. But making sure that you're actually reusing it and leveraging it on social in patterns to make kind of, you know, links to real world events and actually sort of targeting those behaviors is really, really important. So I think that storytelling is a really powerful approach and it gets to people on an emotional level which factual content just doesn't do. And it's something that I think that we're all really bad at. And I think we can use it to actually change the perceptions of what open source is and who should be using it, um, how you access it and what it's for. So. This is kind of, yeah, I think we should tell as many stories as possible. Even if it's a piece of data, even if it's your annual report or like how many new users you've gained. If you frame it up in a story, it's much more powerful. And it's actually going to help you provide information to people that they take in properly rather than just kind of skim reading. And stories are actually for um, the users of your products or services. They're for your team. I think this is probably the best one because if you want to sell someone doing a thing for you, if you frame it in a story and it sounds very, very compelling, they're more likely to do it. Again, with stakeholders or if you need to persuade someone to give you time to work on something, it's really important. And the last bit that I'll just sum up. So although I've said all of these things about, you know, you need to make sure you're targeting it right, stories essentially are about how you make people feel. And making sure you're talking in the right voice at the right time with uh, the right content means that you're actually going to get that feeling from them. And they might forget what you said exactly, but they won't forget how you made them feel about it. That's kind of it. That's uh, the storytelling. So yeah, if there are any questions. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Any questions? Hello. First of all, uh, wonderful presentation. It was quite a pleasure to listen to you. But I got one specific question. Mm. I recently read a book called Influence, which exactly touches on the point of changing a person's self-perception. Yes. The example they gave, very specific, I believe in California, they went to people's houses and asked, would you like to have a billboard on your front wall? Mm. Most, like supporting California nature, for example, most people said no. Yes. But then they went and said, do you want to have like a small, like a very tiny, teeny bit on your front door? They said yes. And mm -mm. people who said yes were more likely to do that thing with a billboard afterwards. Yes. My question is, what kind of techniques do you apply in storytelling to have sort of the same effect? Okay, um, I think probably the easiest one of that, I, th I think that example is more actually about if you offer someone something that's too big and then you offer them a much easier option, they go for it. That's almost just, it's, a v it's kind of a very simple technique that you use sometimes when you're doing sort of pricing models. And very often people will um, assign meaning to the order that you present things in. So if you present kind of uh, not the one you want them to go for first, but then the second one that you really want them to go for, they're more likely to choose that. So if there's a rule of three, it's the same thing when you're kind of choosing off a menu for wine. If you know nothing about wine, you're like, I'm not going to go for the house because that'll make me look shabby. But I'll try and go for like one or two up. So I think it's maybe about that and presenting these sort of huge steps that you could take and then framing the, but if you know you want to engage a little bit, you could do this piece that would be really helpful and much easier. So I think it's sort of the leading people along that journey and offering them an easier choice once you've set up the difficult choice. Mm, sort of, yeah. yes. Yeah. All right. Hi. Um, in open source, there's a lot of uh, very, very dry topics like APIs, libraries, yeah. that sort of stuff. It's all hidden away on GitHub mm. and other repositories. And trying to get people to engage and tell stories about it is difficult because the people actually using it and maintaining it are very, how do you say, fact-oriented, detail-oriented. Yes. Yeah. Do you have any strategies for getting people out of their comfort zone and starting to tell stories about what they're developing? 
mm. as opposed to telling how to use the API. Yeah, I, th I completely agree. It's very difficult. If people are uncomfortable with it, it's quite hard to get them to start doing it. Um, one of the things that we do, because um, I actually find writing quite uncomfortable, so a thing that we do at work is we get people to do a piece to camera and we'll actually just film them very quickly talking about it. Because sometimes you'll find that someone's willing to do that and have a conversation rather than actually sort of sit down and write a long topic or start doing it that way. So. If you have someone who would find it difficult to actually write those pieces, but has all the information, I'd recommend kind of pairing them up with someone else who can facilitate it for them. So you don't put the pressure on them to begin with to do that storytelling. You kind of have someone who's a little bit more comfortable, who can almost do like an interview sort of scenario with them and actually tell it in that way. And also, if they're probably very comfortable with talking about what they have done, and how they feel about something more than they would be kind of framing up in a big sort of product or brand sense. So I'd kind of go for the interviewing for the bigger picture and then asking people just to quickly tell you how they did something and why for kind of the smaller pieces. Does that make sense? Uh, anyone else? Okay. If there are no other questions, then let's thank Holly one more time. Thank you.